Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Sturwer, and welcome to our guest, Hans Vestberg, CEO of Verizon. Hans, great to see you. Andy, great to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Hans, can you give us sort of a state of the union, first of all, about Verizon? What does the business look like right now? What are some key metrics in terms of size and scale of the business? Yeah, we, of course, during the last six, seven years, gone through quite a lot of changes. I mean, started basically changing the structure, how we, how we go to market, consumer and business. But we also dis decided to divest and invest in new areas. We divested much of our media platforms, which was Yahoo, AOL, Huffington Post, etc. And then we acquired a lot of Spectrum. Uh, but we also acquired a uh, prepaid uh, customer base. And uh, more recently, we acquired uh, or have the intention to acquire Frontier. So a lot of changes, a new team, new asset base, but very clear on what we want to do. But the size of Verizon is, of course, enormous. I mean, we hit almost 50% um, of all the households with a bill every month. We are the largest wireless carrier in the, in the country. We're also one of the fastest growing broadband carriers in the country. We have a huge footprint on Fios. We were first out with fiber in the country. Uh, almost 8 million customers right now, or a uh, little bit shy of seven, uh, on the fiber broadband customers. We're also doing uh, 5G uh, fixed wireless access, which is broadband as well, where we, uh, in the second quarter, passed over 3 million uh, of those as well. So we have a lot of size uh, and, of course, uh, a footprint of six, 7,000 stores in the country. We usually say that 90% uh, of the U.S. population has less than 30 minutes to a Verizon store. It's a gigantic operation. We serve 98% of the Fortune 500 uh, with enterprise solutions. So, yeah, it's a big operation that is going through a lot of change. But I think we're in a place that we're, we're in a really good place right now, what we want to do and where we're going. How has network usage and the way people use devices changed over the years? It's a dramatic change. I mean, we all designed our network for voice calls at five o'clock when people were going home from work, maybe did some texting during the day. Right now, I mean, over 50% or almost 60% of all the traffic in the network is some kind of streaming, either on YouTube or whatever. It's just a dramatic change of data usage. Our network has grown 129% over the last five years from a very sizable network. So we have seen that. And also the time when people are using the network has moved. When historically it was a lot around lunch time and then after work. Today uh, it's spread out 24 by 7 when people are using the network. Uh, much more in the evenings, uh, in the mornings uh, on data loads. Uh, but also where they spend it. I mean, I, I remember I was on a lot of interviews during COVID when enormous changes was happening. First of all, nobody moved. But secondly, a lot of people moved from uh, certain uh, states to other states. So also the capacity has moved around a lot in the, in the network. And for us, that's, of course, our state of the art, how we build the network and meeting our customers. We also recently did a, a deep dive into sport and uh, sport arenas, how uh, fans are using the phones. It's just tremendous how much data they use during a, a game when they're live in, the, live in the stadium. They're using the phone, they're uploading and they are sending pictures. They are doing all the different applications of social networking. Uh, and historically, we built our wireless network with a downlink that is way bigger than an uplink, meaning how much data you take down. That was important. But right now in the stadium, we're rebalancing because there's so much going up meaning you're sent to the Instagrams of the words, on the TikToks of the words. That's how you share. And I bet that's true, not just at sporting events, but at like Taylor Swift concerts Oh my too, God, right? I mean, I you should see the yeah. usage we see during those type of concerts. The phones are on all the time. People are actually streaming the whole concert to friends that are somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, and that's right. why it's so important to have an enormously important coverage and capacity in arenas. And we have built basically all NFL arenas, NHL, NBA arenas with the best experience the last five to seven years. You mentioned 5G, and, and I want to ask you about how that rollout is going. Is it slower than expected, and is that related to the C-band expansion and your $53 billion spectrum investment? If you go back to the, the, the launch of 5G and the promise of 5G was better throughput, higher speeds, lower latency, better battery life, a lot of the things were designed for enterprises. 
uh, consumers will always use it. So I think in the beginning there was a lot of discussion, where's the 5G application and all, all of that. We have a, a, a more than two-thirds of our customer base have a 5G phone already. That means that the experience they have with the usage they have on the network has is so much better. They can stream on the phone and all of that. So that's already happened. The other thing that we didn't underestimate, but I talked a lot about it, that was I can do 5G broadband, home broadband, which we have never been able to do in, in previous generation. And today, fixed wireless access, as it's called, we are adding some three to 350,000 new broadband fixed wireless access customers every quarter. That's a 5G service that haven't existed on any previous generation wireless. So that's happening. Then the last piece that I talked a lot of was that with those characteristics of 5G, you can actually do what we call mobile edge compute. You can have compute storage and capacity at the edge of the network offloading the devices or doing it smarter and faster. That we're seeing happening right now. And with Gen AI, uh, the mobile edge compute is sort of an extremely important feature in the design of the network that Verizon has done. And Verizon is the only one that has done it. So there is coming still more application for 5G, but the penetration is high. The rollout is going fast. But right for you said, we bought our or C-band that is sort of where we carry the majority of our uh, 5G traffic. We bought that uh, three or four years ago and we have fast-paced uh, deployment of, of that uh, 5G cap capability the last couple of years. Now we cover more than 250 million people in the United States. Right. Hans, you've been CEO since August of 2018 and the stock's done okay in some time periods, a little less so in other time periods. Yeah, that's tell us, life. Tell us, <laughs> tell us why shareholders should own the stock going forward. I think if you look at our stock, I mean, we, we are uh, in an industry that is growing maybe 1%, 2%. Our goal is to grow faster than that. This year we have a guidance that is clearly growing faster than that. Uh, we have been uh, around 3% of service revenue growth so far this year, ending the second quarter. So I think we can continue to grow and we can also uh, continue to expand our, uh, our EBITDA and we have a commitment or a guideline for uh, guidance for that this year as well. So financially we are in a situation right now where we have transformed a lot. Uh, we have the right base so we can actually start growing on it and we have good product offerings. So I believe that we can grow faster in the market together with our business. At the same time, we have the best yield, I would say, almost on the S&P 500. We're in a yield between 6-7%, depending where we are with, the, uh, with our share price. We have increased our dividend 18 consecutive years. And there's very few stocks at S&P 500 that have done that. I think it's two that has done it longer than us. So you both get a, a, a very good dividend yield from Verizon. And then, of course, I'm expecting appreciation as we are now performing better and better. And we have had years when we didn't perform so well. I mean, I was the first one to say, 22, we didn't perform well. We were not really correct in our product offerings, in our, in our consumer business. But I also did a lot of changes. I changed the management team. I changed the offering. And in 23 and the second quarter, we, when we launched our new consumer offerings, we start to see that uh, actually impacting our, our, our performance. So all in all, I think uh, for shareholders, uh, they should see that our stock appreciation is important, but also understanding that the dividend is something that me and the board feel really strongly about, continue to give our shareholders that back. And just to follow up, so that 6.2% dividend yield, that's safe and secure. Yeah, so my, my capital priorities is very clear. Number one uh, is to invest in our business. That's basically, a, in our case, a capex or infrastructure. We, we are this year between 17 to 17 half billion dollars. That's the lowest we have been in five years since I arrived. And our capital intensity is 12 to 30 percent. Might come up and down a little bit, but we have a really good cadence. The second priority is to pay dividend. And uh, as I said, we've done it for 18 years. And the third one is to paying down our debt. We are on 2.5 times our leverage. We want to get down to below 225. And then the fourth one is sort of uh, uh, buybacks. So that's, that's a priority. So the priority is very high on dividend. You just announced uh, a $20 billion acquisition of Frontier. 
Analysts have suggested that it's perhaps a modest boost for the company. How would you describe it, Hans? Uh, a lot of things is a modest boost on a company turning over 135 billion and having a beat of 48 billion. Uh, we have to agree to that in a free cash flow last year on 18.7 billion. Uh, but what is adding is, of course, uh, increasing our TAM, our, our addressable market. Uh, total addressable market. Yeah, yeah, to yeah total addressable market. And, and think about this. I mean, uh, Frontier today uh, have transformed the company from being a copper-based company to having roughly 7.2 million ho passings with fiber. They have more than 50% of the revenues on fiber. Uh, and when, when it comes to EBITDA, it's even higher. So they are a fiber company uh, that we can build on in two ways. One, we can just bolt on to our current Fios uh, footprint. So that's very efficient, a lot of synergies. The second is that we can, in these areas, also offer a wireless service to this customer. So they got the converged service. We can offer the whole distribution network we have. So that we both can bring them up to our standard when it comes to penetration and ARPU, and secondly, we can cross-sell other products. So it might not look super big from a financial point of view, but from addressing broadband in the, in the entire United States, we are now on our way to do that. You mentioned Fios, Hans, and I'm wondering how critical that is to the company's growth plans. Where does it stand? That's the consumer bundle. Yes, service. The, the consumer mm -hmm. fiber just had the 20 years anniversary. We were first out in the United States by a fiber offering, and um, we, at least what I recall, uh, nobody believed fiber would work. It's been an extraordinary journey, a fantastic product. Uh, wherever we build it, we, we take a very high market share of it. That will continue. We have uh, Fios in the northeastern states, and now we are getting the frontier uh, states as well. So we will have fiber offerings in 31 states. And then on top of that, we have fixed wireless access in more than 60, covering more than 60 million households. So we are, we are going for seeing that we can offer consumer broadband in, in all places, in all states in this country. So Fios is an important piece of our work uh, and a very profitable work for us as well. A lot of people talk about the unbundling that's been going on in terms of consumers and cable. Yes. Now there's talk of rebundling because yeah. you've got all these different streaming services. What is your view on that? And is that something you guys are actually involved in? Yeah, I think we are the, we are leading the rebundling in the market. I mean, we saw pretty early on that all the streaming services coming out is uh, is getting very complicated because you have a lot of them. If you think about it today, the average household probably have some between three to four uh, 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 streaming services. Uh, what we tried to do uh, was, of course, seeing that we can offer that on top of our uh, our offerings, not including them because customers want to choose what they have. So we have a perk system which is exclusive to us. We have the 10 largest streaming services in, in the world and in the United States. All of them are for 10 bucks uh, or 10 dollars, which is cheaper that you can get it from Netflix or from Max or uh, from Disney Plus. And the whole idea is, of course, that we take the co cost of acquisition of the customers away from the streaming guys, and uh, and we bundle that into our services. But it's a choice for our customers, so they take what uh, wireless plan they want to have, and then they take what uh, streaming uh, perk they want to have. But uh, they save money with us on it. So it's a value to our customers. And of course, we get the wholesale from our streaming streamers uh, because they take away a lot of cost acquisition. Our churn is way lower than theirs. So it's a win-win. And we can combine offers that nobody else can do. We can combine in Netflix with Max and offer that to our customers because that's exclusive to us. We started with this five, six years ago, and, and now we have developed this to a very important accretive service for ourselves and a really important rebundling uh, for our customers. So it's a customer value or consumer value we're thinking about there. And so you're saying the streamers are okay with you putting their services together with their competitors, essentially? Yes. They are, and, and ultimately that is driving uh, a lot of uh, combinations that we have never seen before. Uh, and we are in constant dialogue with our streaming partners to see what is working best and what is the market really interested in right now. Uh, and of course, they are meeting some type of saturation as well. So then retention becomes way more important than acquisition. 
we are in that business. Everyone has a mobile phone uh, and we work constantly to be how do you do retention and how do you create value for your customers, not only having the best wireless network, but also what other things do you have on top of it. Right. In a way, that's sort of competing with the cable companies. And on the other hand, the cable companies are looking to get into your business by offering wireless. Yeah. How seriously concerned are you about them getting into your business? We create optionality. We have Fios, you can take all the hundreds of channels if you want, or you take only the, the broadband offering and you have streaming on top of it and you choose whatever perk you have. So the whole idea uh, of our consumer insights is that we want to give flexibility and choice uh, and whatever is suiting you and your household best. Uh, when it comes to the, the cable companies, they, they are, as you know, offering, of course, cable service, but also wireless services. Uh, and, and the larger ones, they, they are, of course, our customers because they are on, on our network because they don't have their own wireless network. So I would see them as a very important large enterprise customers of us uh, that we are serving. Then we're competing with them, both on the broadband but also on wireless. So I think that they are doing a good work to bundle their services. Uh, what we are really focused on is, of course, seeing that, first of all, this is an economical good uh, deal for us, which we think. Secondly, it's also that we, we, should, we should lose less than our fair share to them, because ultimately, if, if they take ten, 10 new customers, all those 10 new customers come to Verizon on top of our network uh, and are accretive. So we should lose. Of those 10, it should be less than our market share going there. And that's what we see so far. And this is a long-term relationship. We have been on this for five, six years. And the two largest cable operators in the country are both on our network. I want to shift gears a little bit, Hans, and ask a little bit about you. You are from Sweden. And you run. That's correct. That's correct. And you run one of America's biggest companies, but it's also one of America's biggest companies that's not particularly global. Uh, Have you ever thought about taking Verizon into more of a global position? So, what is sometimes not really known about Verizon is that we operate in 150 countries on the business to business side. The consumer business we have is only in the U.S. The wireless business is only in the U.S. But we serve American companies, uh, especially large enterprises across the globe. But we feel that the business in the United States and what we're really good at, our capabilities are very much focused in the United States. So uh, I think we, we're going to continue to focus on the United States, focus on broadband, wireless uh, and seeing that we serve all the customers. We're, we're number one with all customer groups, consumers, SMBs, government, large enterprises with the uh, broadband and the wireless offering. So we see this as a still a very important growth opportunity uh, on a product that today is a necessity. Nobody can live without wireless nor broadband. Uh, so I think we're on the right time with the right product. And final question, Hans, you are a sports guy, a fitness guy, and so I'm curious as to how you see work-life balance, and <laughs> how, can people, how can people better optimize their work-life balance? Maybe some tips yeah. from Hans about that. Um, I, of course, work a lot, uh, but I'm also disciplined what I work with. So I, for, so I have been since 2009 basically measured every hour I work. Uh, in order to direct them to things that makes a difference for Verizon and where I as a CEO and chairman are the only one that can do it. So even though I work a lot, I try really to do things that is really making a difference. Then of course, I always I have my family that is important to me, but I also need my time because I'm I'm with people all the time. I mean, I, I have I go from meeting to meeting, I meet different people, they might meet me one time in five, ten years. I'm the, one of the biggest brand ambassadors for the company. I need to be my A game in every meeting, if it's internal or external. In my way, to actually be on the A game is that I need to sport a lot. And uh, we are all different. I run a lot. I train a lot. Every type of uh, physical activity is really where I get my head of thinking about other things. But I also feel... Uh, much stronger coming out from that. So yeah, I run a lot. I, I swim, I bicycle sometimes, I lift weights. Any sport I can even touch I would do because ultimately for me that has been the way for me to take uh, the, the daily meetings and the importance of showing up, 
with your A game in everything you're doing every day in the week, uh, sports is uh, an important piece for me at that. All right, your A game indeed it is. <laughs> Hans Vestberg, CEO of Verizon, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you, Andy. This is at Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.